All right, guys, welcome to another episode here of Vital Tradition Podcast. I'm Dustin Murphy. Got a very special guest today. This is Mr. Andy Farrow. He's a uh, part owner over at Farrow Marine, and uh, we're going to talk boats today. I am super pumped. Um, and specifically, we're going to try and walk you through as much as we can think about uh, the beginner buying a boat. So the process of you coming in cold, never done in, uh, never buying a boat before and uh, trying to get you in the driver's seat for the first time. So without further ado, Andy, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and the business? Well, I'm Andy Farrell. Uh, like Dustin said, I'm part owner of Farrell Marine. Uh, I'm second generation. My parents, Bill and Nancy, started the company back in 1989. Um, started in the racing boat industry with Baja racing boats. Um, nice out of world but we've worked our way down we did cutty cabins i mean i've pretty much been in everything sold everything and now we're down into lung fishing boats and then godfrey pontoons and hurricane deck boats um over the years we've kind of cut back we went exclusive with mercury two years ago um have been the best choice we ever made and basically sticking all bronze with they, they stick behind their product and build great stuff for us so awesome yeah that's really great um not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but what do you think of Cuddy Cabins? That's, I didn't know you, you worked with those. That's pretty cool. You know, I think they're a dying breed. They'll probably come back at some point, but yeah. you know, just that the, the sport world is more out there again, rather than the Cuddy yeah. Cabin world where you're not sleeping on the water anymore. Um, the good old days of us traveling the Mississippi river, putting that trempolo run all the way up to Hudson are far from over. Um, but it's going to be a while before I do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i just was curious with covid i feel like I, i've heard a lot of people trying to get out camping i just was wondering if that was translating on the water at all but, no not yet i mean you always have your people that do want to sleep out on the boat and honestly yeah. there's people that turn pontoons into houses you know they put double boonies on with full frames and yeah. I mean, and a slide or yeah they got slides on them nowadays <laughs> they got twin engines on some of these boats coming in yeah, yeah sometimes more i think down in Florida and stuff. Holy smokes, man. It's crazy what you can do with a pontoon nowadays, but uh, yeah, a lot of those are starting about 125 grand. So I know it's not for everybody. No, and not <laughs> around here. I mean, we got our waters aren't big enough for this. No, stuff. no, not unless you really enjoy spending a lot of money to go uh, about, you know, hundred miles an hour for three seconds and then you got to shut her down. <laughs> yeah. Other side of the lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, fun. Oh, so you said you went uh, exclusive with Murky about two years ago. Um, is that just because they're a local company here in Wisconsin? Is that, uh, was that product driven? You know, what, what kind of made you move to Mercury alone? Um, I would say one product driven. Um, I, I, I personally feel Mercury is probably the best product out there. Okay. Um, don't get me wrong. They're all great products nowadays. They're all building and kind of, I would say on the backbone, probably working together for what we don't know. Sure. Um, but Mercury just seems to release their own technology year after year, stuff that the rest of the market doesn't have. Um, obviously, like now releasing a 600 horsepower, you hear seven Marine gets bought out by Volvo. Next thing you know, Volvo shuts it down and Mercury releases a 600, take place right. of that in a V12 engine. No one else is doing that. I mean, Yamaha, when you start talking in their engines, they're, they weigh a lot more than Mercury. Um but product reliability, I mean, you're coming right out of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, um, right. local home. Um, obviously, being a small business owner, I love supporting local, so I'd rather support a local company, you know, that has worthy yep. product. And, um, you know, they're, they're a great company to work with. They've always treated us well. So Awesome. Yeah, I personally only ever own Mercury Motors, but not by choice. It just happened to be what I've dealt with, and I haven't had any problems with them. I love the performance and customer service has been absolutely amazing. Uh, actually, I, cause I did have, um, a lower unit impeller issue, uh, on my pontoon at some point, but th they got it taken care of right away. And actually the reps that I talked to were just fantastic. And it was no issues with getting in service. So yeah, they're yeah. good people. They're local. And you know, with them, I can have a, if, if my techs need help or whatever, we get, we have a mercury rep, um, that's literally tech service done everything. Um, but he can be here that day if we absolutely need another eye on something to look at it or give a final approval to the warranty department from Mercury to say, yeah, this is warranty compared to, no, this was a user error or something. Right. Uh, we've seen it happen and, you know, everyone has mistakes, but they, they yep. seem to stick behind them. No, that's great. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned uh, second generation. You're in Wanakee, Wisconsin. Is that correct? That is correct. We're at 5341 okay. Wanakee, Wisconsin. Um, been there our whole time. You know, we're in our second building. Uh, we got a 20,000 square foot showroom. Uh, currently, every boat I have for sale is in the showroom. So <laughs> that's how hard it is to get product in right now. Yeah, um, wow. We organized it today. But yeah, I actually, I have bare spots in the showroom. It's so empty. Um, pulled wow. two boats in today and they both sold today. So it's changing hourly, it seems like right now. It is so crazy. Like just to be in the boat industry, like as a customer for pr- pretty hot and heavy for about eight years. And then now kind of coming back into the market uh, here two years later and having to come in at this time, I just could not believe how fast, even in the used market, boats are going. It's unbelievable. It's almost like the housing market, like which is crazy to even think about that you have to be like Johnny on the spot if you want to get a boat. Like that's insane. Oh yeah, I mean, I had I was working with a pontoon on three different couples, um, all from Chicago too. And one of them drove up and asked if I would come in on a Sunday to meet them to get the deal done because they watched their parents or um, take care of their parents. So I met them this Sunday and they bought the pontoon and the other couple drove up yesterday to come look at it and it was already gone. Um, And then another couple drove up or called me in that I was working with and um, responding to my voicemail, I left them, but the unit was also sold. So you know, if we could have more product, we could sell more, but you know, you right. can also hold the respon- manufacturers responsible because they're having suppliers issues too. So. Yep. Yeah, totally. It's just, it's a weird time uh, for everything, but I think, I think we should dive right in and maybe just with an asterisk up front, we're going to talk about the process uh, of buying a boat and what you want to ask, what you want to look for. Um, but maybe not necessarily specific to COVID times or like the issues we're having now. So maybe take what we say and then apply it to like, you know, most scenarios, but then obviously right now you're not going to be able to walk in and do this and then walk away with a boat possibly, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah. So let's just start from the very beginning. You you're, you're now into, hurricane uh deck boats uh you said you got godfrey and lund pontoons in the showroom and lund uh fishing boats and crossovers is that correct did i miss anything no so unfortunately lund pontoons is no longer in production currently they're letting harris take over but really okay but currently they're not building here they're not building the uh, lund pontoons they're built at the harris factory um so they're letting harris get back into production with all the, the supplies going on. So interesting. Is that just a COVID thing or was that um, kind of uh, before it, it? It was the same factory. And I think there's a lot of Harris dealers starting to get mad. They couldn't receive enough product because they're starting to build another line out of there. Um, oh, so kind okay. of just, and it only made sense. I mean, don't get me wrong. One built a great pontoon. The best one was their fishing one and beat everyone by far. That was crazy. Um, awesome. <laughs> but at the same point, you know, they were new and her into the game and obviously the factory's got to hold into yeah. what they're at. So, yeah, now that makes sense. All right. So we're going to, we're going to focus on the boats you've got there. Um, and maybe we can touch on some that you don't, if you want to talk about them, but um, people can apply these same principles to any boat that they're going into um, and whether it's fishing you know, pleasure boating, you know, sporting, wakeboarding, skiing, whatever. I think, I think these principles are all going to apply. Uh, the process of buying a boat is the same, most likely um, yeah. across those platforms. So, um, all right, I'm going to play the beginner customer and I'm going to walk into your shop for the first time. And I know absolutely nothing. And I'm just going to ask you dumb questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's a typical. <laughs> right. You've never heard this before. No. Um, but, that it's a dumb question yeah like, you know, like any smart person will tell you there is no such thing as a dumb question right. Ask away, that's what we're here for right exactly and that's why we're doing this we want to get you guys kind of like that comfort so you can go in and buy your first boat and not be intimidated or overwhelmed so i'm right. going to walk through the door and i can just right away i'm like yep there's a lot of cool looking boats here and i'm going to want to walk around um what's kind of the what would be your recommendation on how to start? So you're walking through the door. Do you go talk to somebody right away? Do you just kind of walk around and look on your own? Um, and maybe kind of a twofold question, maybe answer it from the perspective of you got somebody coming in who knows they want a certain kind of boat. And then maybe you got somebody who's literally like, I just want to get a boat, but I have no idea what I'm doing. 
All right. So, I mean, first starting off with the person that knows what they, you know, if they want a fishing boat, they want a pontoon boat, they want a deck boat, definitely come in and say something right away so we can at least point you in the direction of what we have. Sure. Uh, being a small family owned business, we're not like used car sales. And we don't like to push. Um, we're not a pushy dealership. I'd rather have you look at the product, get comfortable, get in it, and then we'll come and check on you in a couple minutes. Um, but by you letting us know what you're looking at, it also gives us time to get our brains going and look at our product to see what we have so we can explain to you what's going on, what we have, um, what's available, and different options to see if it fits your need. Okay. Um, as, as a new boat buyer, um, I think it's always a good idea to talk to someone. But again, at the same time, I think you need to walk around and look at product for a lengthy time um, to see what's out there, to see if anything strikes a bell. Um, you don't want to be the guy who steps in and comes in and be like, I think I want a fishing boat, but you know, the wife wants a pontoon boat and the family wants a deck boat. You're just going to confuse yourself more. You got to kind of take the time just on your own, come in, look around, see what triggers your eye and then start asking questions and go from there. Sure. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. It's really hard. And it, you know, I asked that question cause I'm sure you get it like inevitably that that has to happen, but I wouldn't recommend going in and, you know, perusing it like you would, you know, like the mall walking into a random store. Like if you want to buy a boat, do a little research at home first, it's going to be a better buying experience for you and for the dealer working with you to not have to go over like the super, super basics. But, you know, again, if it's, if it's go in or don't go in, go in, like, it's not, you're not going to ruin anybody's day, but you'll probably do yourself a better service to at least figure out where you kind of want to start before you head in. But, um, so those two answers, uh, uh, we got those down. Now let's let's figure out what um, generally do you have on the floor? So I'm walking in the door. Am I going to find mostly new boats? Will you have used boats available to look at? Are they going to be inside uh, in the showroom? How does that work for you guys specifically, I guess? So with us, all of our, our showroom is going to always be new product. Uh, okay. You know, and we kind of we kind of sort our showroom. We try to keep the fishing lumped together and the pontoon lumped together and the deck boats lumped together. Um, you know, we always start with our most popular models from the front, kind of work to your least popular to the back. Uh, but at the same time, with like pontoons, we try to run them in order of size. So I try to start with like say the, the larger first and work down to smaller. Um, that way we can run by because you can instantly look at like a pontoon and go, whoa, that thing's huge. I you know right. that I can't handle that. Yep. Um, where a fishing boat, even a, a 20 foot fishing boat next to a 16 looks huge when they're side by side, but when they're not, you can't tell the difference. They, yeah. you know, it's quite frankly, and when you get on the water, you got to remember it's going to shrink. Right. So the, the perception of it is everyone comes in goes, I want a 20 foot boat. And then look at the show. I'm like, wow, this thing is monstrous. Right. Um, let's go down to an 18 footer. They get down to an 18 footer and they're like, eh, this thing, you know, this is probably the right size. And then they look at the 16s and 17s like, yeah, you know, I definitely want to go bigger on it. Um, but some people get scared and, you know, look at a 20 and say it's way too big. They got to jump into a 16 instantly. Okay. Um, so while you're on the top of the length, how, what are, when you get somebody coming in, typically do they come in with their own information as far as where they're going to store it? Some of these basic questions that, you know, you're probably going to want to have the answer to if you're going to buy a boat. So where are you going to store it? how big is your storage area? Um, because you're going to want to know that like, yeah, you might be super comfortable in an 18 foot boat, but if you've got a 16 foot garage, that math doesn't add up. <laughs> so you've yeah, got to have a plan, you know, that would be the number one question. Um, I think that gets forgotten by a lot of people buying boats. You know, they, they don't aspect that they just come in and look at it. They're like, Oh, you know, 18 foot boat. My garage is 20 feet. It'll fit in there. Well, an 18 foot boat's an 18 foot boat, but you got a 27 inches of motor hanging off the back and a trailer tongue sticking off the front two feet. You're at 21 and a half, 22 feet. It's not yep. going to fit in a 20 foot garage. That's exactly um, right. The big I, advantage, everything's coming swing tongue now. So I was just going to ask, is that bit. standard in the industry now? Because it wasn't. It's part, yeah, okay. that's pretty much standard. Okay. And if it is like a pontoon or a deck boat, every dealer is going to order it with the swing okay. tongue for that. That makes sense. Alone. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, man, I couldn't tell you how many people still like that I've talked to and, and you run into that issue where you just don't compensate for the, the space the motor takes up. It's yeah. so easy to forget. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but no, you figure it out pretty quick. My first questions when I'm working with someone is, you know, where, what, what are you, where are you storing this? What are you putting it in? Like, 
do you have you measured your garage door? Because a lot of them want to put it in a garage. Well, pontoons, I mean, we have to have a 10 foot garage door high to even get it in on a bunk trailer. Yep. Uh, and then they want to talk scissors trailers, which are probably the most unstable trailer in the world on a pontoon. And I would say 90% of the people are going to dump it on a corner. Yep. Um, so it's just, you got to look at all those aspects and get it in the right way so you know what you're getting. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot of things I kind of want to expand upon there. And I think the first one that's really a long hanging fruit for me as a, as a previous pontoon owner for eight years is uh, that ceiling height of the garage for one. Cause that is, you're right. That is definitely something that is another easily overlooked um, aspect when you go to buy a boat. And the second would be trailering and, and specifically physically trailing the pontoon and then your options. So um I'm curious how many people you co- people come in and, and kind of talk to you about stories about dumping pontoons or not realizing how difficult it can be to tow a pontoon for any length that they're really not convenient to travel with. So people are coming in wanting a family boat. Pontoons are probably, I mean, they're very versatile when it comes to family, but very inconvenient to move around. Um, and so like people that may be first time boat buyers or you know, have never trailered a boat. Um, what are their options? Um, if they kind of seriously are looking at pontoons, but are are worried about the trailering aspect. Well, if it's local, um, obviously if you're going to try to find like a slip on water or some, say you don't live on the water, um, you know, I mean, you got other dealers and uh, marinas that slip around here. Um, unfortunately we're not on the water, but you can rent a slip from them and then we can deliver it to them to their meet you put it in the water, you take it, use it, and put it in your slip. Come yep. back in spring or uh, summer and fall, we'll pick it back up, take it back, store it for you, and bring it back. So you don't have to deal with the trailer. That's um, perfect. If you're further away, um, I mean, we can get delivery services to you, um, but you might want to find someone local to be able to pull it in and out for you. Um, the hard part or a marina that you can store it at. Um, the hard part's going to be is tri-tunes and sport tubes are becoming so popular on pontoons. Um, you can't just use any old scissors trailer to lift those out of the water. It's got to be a special hydraulic trailer and they're very expensive. Um, so not even a lot of dealers have them. So you've got to have the right services to be able to handle that. Okay. So maybe all the listeners out there that are keying in on a tri-tune versus a pontoon, um, keep that in mind, especially if you're not planning on buying a trailer, which I think most of them do not come standard with a trailer. If you buy a new one, is that correct? You'd have a lot to order of them do not, no. um, yeah. Especially in our territory, we just get so many on the lakes, whether it's Lake Wisconsin, Mendota, Monona, Wabisa, Kaganza, right. there is no need for trailers and they're at a marina or something. So we just put it yep. in and pick it back up for them. Yeah. And that's a wonderful service. I did utilize that myself and it was, it's extremely, extremely convenient. And when you break down the price of owning a trailer and the storage of the trailer alone, it's, it pays for itself to have somebody come in and give it to you uh, twice a year in the spring and in the fall, put it in the spring, in the spring and take it out in the fall. It's fantastic. And especially if you're going to store your boat with the uh, Marina who is doing that service for you, it's even better because then you're just, you don't even have to drive it there to drop it off for storage and vice versa, getting out in the springtime. Um, is that something you guys offer as well um, for storage options of people using that service? Yeah, so I mean, we'll bring it to you in the spring, come pick it back up in the fall and store it. I mean, yeah, as you hit on the trailer side of it, I mean, a new trailer for a tri is $4,000 for the 22, 24 footers. I mean, we're local lakes, Madison, uh, we're 175 each way. So you're 350, you're talking well over 10 years to pay off that yeah. trailer right. and hauling. By the time you get there, you basically waste it on insurance and all the other time. I mean, you're talking, it would take you 15 to 18 years to pay that trailer off at that service fee. Right. And most people, I would probably argue, are not owning that boat that long. No. So you really well, kind of have to, unless you have a storage you issue. You upgrade or you downgrade pretty quick just because it was too big or too small or you right. wanted different features. Right. Yeah, especially, I mean, that's a great point. So first time boat buyer, all the more reason not to do that. With the one exception that if, you, <laughs> if you're worried about resale coming from personal experience, having a trailer is a big deal for reselling a pontoon. Right. So, you know, maybe consider it 
depending on your circumstance and your storage, you're going to have to, that's going to be a little bit of a decision on the customer's part for sure. But as a beginner, you're really going to, those are going to be your two big deciding factors in the pro and con column. You're going to have a lot of pros in the cost and utilization efficiency, lack of trailering on your part, but then the con is definitely going to be resale. If you decide that that pontoon is not for you for whatever reason, it's going to be much more difficult to sell it without a trailer. So correct, yeah, and the, you know, I mean, you can pay someone to haul it to wherever they're at, or they can pay it the buyer. The hard part is, is used trailers very rarely are out there for pontoons. Um, and new trailers, dealers are going to hold it for themselves rather than, you know, I mean, they'll sell it to you, but it's going to be at a, at a price because I need to get it to my customers to keep my product going in case someone wants a trailer. Right. And unfortunately right now is a whole different ball game with COVID and oh, still yeah. supply demand issue. I mean, I can't get trollers, uh, trailers for certain bullets. So it's like, I really don't want to sell them loose, but if I have to, I will, um, to get something done. Right. Right. That's, uh. It's just this time is just pretty unique and it's tough. So again, like normally you'd probably have a little bit more access to trailers, but probably even more of an argument now to use the, the rental service if it's available. And, you know, would you see that's pretty common in the industry? I know you talked about you guys are pretty good about doing it, but um, would you say that's common? With Is that a generality we can throw out there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say most common, I would say it's 50-50 on trailer purchasing versus non Okay. Um, we're getting more and more that are starting to buy trailers because they want to travel with them, do family trips again. I think it's a lot of COVID again because you're traveling, you want to go rent a cabin somewhere and go hang out, bring your own boat so you don't have to rent one there. Um, but again, we always hear the stories of people driving around. They're like, oh, I flew by a semi and it felt like the boat was going to fly off the trailer. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, it's a big sail behind you on a pontoon. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're not fun to trailer. They just really aren't. There's no good way about it. Um, I can't speak to the tritunes or the newer trailers, but you know, I, this has only been you know seven years ago, and it was 2014, brand new 2014 regular pontoon. It just wasn't fun to trailer. Like it just. No, I mean you get tandem axle trailers. You know, more axles you add, the better it is stability wise. But it's still yeah. not fun. I mean, there's still big right. sales behind you. Your gas yep. mileage just destroyed by it. So correct. Yeah, it's not something you want to be touring the country with, that's for sure. No. Um, well, let's, uh, I okay, so let's just start with this question and see where it goes. But what are the most common questions you get in general from first-time boat buyers when they walk through the door? Um, I think most most common question, obviously, is price. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what they, they all want to start out with a cheaper boat in case they don't like it. Um, second would be used products. Do I have anything used? Because you can generally buy used, use it for a year and you're not going to take the killing just like a car that you would not buy sure. and sell after a year. Um, so that's going to be your first two top. Um, I would say next is, I mean, obviously is going to be like the best package. You know, they want to make sure they're all in at what the price you give them. Yeah. Um, unfortunately there's so many dealers that are turning to the car auto world where they have all these documentation fees and all that kind of stuff. Um, you get to the final sitting table and next thing you know, there's a thousand dollars tacked on for unnecessary fees. Um, so I think being upfront and honest with people is going to be the biggest thing because customers, I mean, especially new people, they don't understand that. So, right. Uh, you scare them when you do that kind of stuff. They, they think then your service is going to be the same way. Like all of a sudden you're just going to start tacking on for service items and um, it adds on. So, uh, and then storage is huge. I mean, I think a lot of customers ask like, you know, I know this isn't going to fit in my garage, especially in the pontoon world and hurricane world. You know, do I offer winter storage? What are the prices? Sure. Um, and then again, product, you know, they don't know what they're looking for. So they'll come in and say, Hey, you know, I want to fish. I want to ski. I want a tube. I want to, you know, just go out cruising. What, what am I looking at? And, you know, obviously it, you totally got to start asking questions back as far as, well, how much fishing are you doing compared right. to recreational? I mean, how much are you tubing and skiing? Or are you just tubing? Because right. it, it makes a big difference on the boat you get into. Yep. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a multi-question deal. We, uh, you ask us, we have to ask you questions back to get yeah. you a right answer. Do you guys have any sort of like 
I mean, you do it long and as you have, you probably, do you have some sort of sheet typed up where it's like, here's the progression of like, you know, the, basically like the 90, 10 rule broken down, like, okay, so what are you going to do 90% of the time? Cause you're not going to find a perfect boat for everything you want to do ever. So here's your 90% of the time. Now, what are you doing in that 90 house it's broken up? You know, is it like 60% tournament fishing and maybe you take your wife and kids out three weekends a year, or is it like skiing and wakeboarding and maybe you throw a line in when you're drinking a beer or something like, you know, <laughs> there's just so yeah, many I questions, think, but and that's uh, it just gets hard. And, you know, of course it's a different answer depending on who's there. If it's right. just like, generally, if it's just a husband there, they're going to tell you most of the time it's fishing. <laughs> well uh, yeah you gotta tease that, that out because uh... as soon as the boss comes in <laughs> right you know, it turns tables now i yep. now we're no i want to relax i want to hang out and um you know i think lund's done a great job with that creating a lot of these crossovers now so they can get you into the family fun you know let the husband throw a rod or two in the water and yep. Um, yep. cast and jig while you got the wife hanging out in the front of the boat relaxing or the back of the boat <laughs> Yeah, I have, I haven't personally been in them, but I have been eyeing it for about a year and I've talked to two people now this year already about like that should be their next purchase based on the way they want to utilize their water time. Uh, it's just, it's pretty incredible what you could do with that single platform without a break in the bank, B taking up a ton of storage. I mean, that's 1775 with a 115, you could legitimately fish almost any pro circuit for angling out there and compete on a very high level and you could take your kids out tubing and skiing uh wakeboarding i mean you're not going to be like crossing or i mean checking all the boxes on the on the water sports like to the maximum capability but you're going to be able to go fast enough you're going to have enough horsepower and torque to pull people and you're still going to be able to seat the whole family plus the in-laws when they come to visit legally you got bow riding cushions for the wife. You've got bench seats for the kids and you got plenty of room to move around and store your tackle. You got a bimini top that's stowable. I mean, they've kind of thought about all this really, really well. The things that you would stumble over in older models or other boats. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. They basically shrunk a pontoon into a fishing boat. Yeah. Man. And made it easier to trailer and a little bit more efficient. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Shallow uh, water is easier to run, easier to ride. You know, loading, unloading is a lot easier. You're talking yeah. 17 foot boat, not a 20 to 25 foot boat. Um, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that gets a lot easier when you start getting into the fishing boat world. But yeah, yeah, and it's not for everybody though. You know, people that come in and they're they don't really fish, or maybe they know somebody that would they have on the boat and fish a little bit, but it's not their primary use. And you know, I could see they're kind of probably between a deck boat and a pontoon most of the time, but. Mm-hmm. We, we're getting a lot more jumping over to the fishing boat line in the really? cross the world just because the, you know they want to go out and just hang out on the water yeah. but they don't want to be that big boat i mean you're talking a lot of times it's two to four people people buy 24 foot pontoons and run for two to four people on it you feel like you're just like wasting money yeah. and sitting there you know a fishing boat you're close by you can still talk you're stable uh, you can handle big water Honestly, you're faster in case a storm comes in. You can get off the water faster and easier. Yeah, that's uh, a great point. It's just all about it's becoming a lot easier. So yeah, yeah, that's a really those are really good attractions that uh, people might not think of from the get go. Um, sp- speaking along those lines, what are some of the questions? So we kind of covered the basics on what people are kind of asking the popular questions people coming in are asking as the dealer and somebody who's has kind of seen everything uh, what are some of the questions people should be asking when they come in that aren't in your opinion? Um, Again, I think the biggest one is, you know, the sizes of boats for like overall storage is huge because it doesn't get asked enough by people. Sure. Um, Other things they should be, you know, they should be asking is about service. You know, they, they totally forget that aspect when they're buying a boat. And the next thing you know, they they can afford the monthly payments to buy it on financing, but then it comes to well, you got a you know a couple hundred bucks a year here for winterizing. If you need to store it somewhere, I mean, you're talking probably by the time you winterize store, you got a couple, you got a grand or two stuck into it. Um, you know, people don't understand the back. It's not like a car where you just park it in your driveway or in your garage outside. These things right. have to be protected, and um, it costs more money to do that. And, you know, this is a, this is a luxury, not a need like a car is. So there, there's a lot totally. of stuff that has to be taken into it. Totally. And I think another thing to point out, just talking about storage of pontoons is 
you know, if you live in an HOA or a neighborhood that has restrictions, like you're going to want to check with that too, before you go buy the boat and realize afterwards, uh, you can't park a boat in your driveway legally Definitely with your not. HOA. A of, even a lot of cities don't even allow parking on the streets or in the yep. driveway, you know, you're allowed to have so many vehicles in your driveway. So, yep. So that's something that's not too obvious, especially if you're a first time buyer, you may not know that, but you're going to want to check it out because that would be a real big bummer to buy that boat, get home and figure out you don't have storage for it where you thought you did. Um, we'll but you guys, a lot more of it these last couple of years, you know, last this last winter, I'm sure we're going to see it this winter again. So many people are buying boats and they're just flying out to buy a boat and buying it. Never owned one, buying it. And next thing you know, they're they're not taking delivery now because we're not forcing it. But they're going to come back in the fall in the fall next year and be like, oh, I forgot I need to store this or I can't afford a thousand dollars to store this. What do I do? Right. Well, throw the cover on, put it in a farm barn somewhere that only charges you 200 bucks and deal with animals. and. Molds. Oh yeah. Mice and your seat cushions get torn up and you got mouse poop in there and that, you know, you don't want to do that to a brand new boat. I mean, no. that's just, yeah. And if you got batteries on there, I mean, that's a whole nother, whole nother can of worms, really. If you get, if you're not taking care of the rest of the stuff, cause you're probably not, if you're just throwing it somewhere last minute, you're probably not taking care of the boat. We probably so, didn't get it winterized. Yeah, you probably didn't disconnect your batteries. And so now in the spring, you're going to be replacing batteries because you let them die too far or whatever. Right, right. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, in your opinion, and obviously you can just use what's in your showroom, what, what would you consider the best boat for the money for a beginner coming in their first boat purchase? Where are they going to get their most bang for their buck? Um, so first, I guess, if you're talking in the fishing boat world, sure. Yeah. Break it. I guess, break it down pleasure versus fishing, I guess is probably yeah, good. I, I guess to get into that. I mean, even across of it would be the impact XS 1775. Sure. Um, it's a great length boat. It's almost 18 feet. Everyone has in their brain, 18 feet It's 17 feet, 10 yeah. inches. <laughs> they come in and they were, they're like, I want an 18 foot boat. So they go to the 1875 and you're like, well, right. that's almost 19 feet. That's not 18 right. feet. Um, so 1775 is by far our most common too. Um, but you have a lot of room in the back to sit people comfortably. Uh, you got a good enough deck up front to put your cushions out and let the kids and wife hang out up there while you're fishing or vice versa. You just want to go all three right. guys fishing or three arrows fishing. You got all the room in the world to do it, you know, yeah. um, good power with the 115 on it. Um, you're talking a mid 40 mile an hour boat. So plenty good with that. Yeah. Um, Going to the pontoon world, um, you know, I always say 22 foot's the most common. One, it's the most easily to resell because it fits in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the most common size. Uh, 20 footer is going to get small, especially when you're looking in the pontoon world. Uh, so we're talking 20 feet compared to a 17 foot fishing boat. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's when I say small, it seems weird, but it really does when you're side by side. A 22 seems a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, and then resale, like I said, you got to look at it for other people's aspect if you're not going to keep it or whatever. Um, right. And then deck, deck boats are always going to be that 18 foot, maybe 20 foot range. Um, but I would say new beginners, honestly, your best bet would be a pontoon or, you know, like a 17 foot fishing boat to get you okay. out of and get stuff going. Okay. Now, um, kind of to piggyback on that question, I think this is a great time to start talking just, to, just a little bit about motors and power. Um, so that 1775 and the pontoon, um, 99% of time you're going to run into outboard motors, which is, uh, the motor that you see hanging off of the back of the boat. It looks like a separate entity because it is, um, the alternative would be an inboard motor, which is more like a car motor that's internalized within the boat structure. And all you see is what would be basically the lower unit and the propeller out the back underneath the water line. Um, now I don't, I know deck boats kind of, I've seen them both ways. I'm not sure which ones, um, the newer hurricanes are running, if they're inboard or outboard, but would you, you know, I guess first let's touch on inboard versus outboard for beginners and what, you know, is there a right direction for beginners or wrong? And then maybe start to talk about powering your first boat to make sure you're not making any mistakes on that first purchase. Yeah. So definitely smart idea. Um, outboard is by far more popular. Um, one, you have a lot more control of the boat with an outboard. Uh, okay. I run in, run in shallower waters, less damage to be done if you kind of hit something. Um, 
IOs and outboards. Outboards seems to be so much more pricier. Um, they've come down quite a bit and kind of leveled themselves out with the IOs. Um, IOs are kind of going back into the off circuit world. Um, okay. You no, know, they're meant for, like you said, it's a car engine. So it's meant for bigger product. Um, so when you're running like the big offshore boats and stuff like that, but even that's all running outboards now. Really? Um, you're talking some of these big guys down in Florida and California, they're talking, they're running yeah. four to six outboard engines right. on, rather than two inboard engines. Um, it's, it's just cost effective. Um, outboards are a lot more easier for maintenance. Yeah. Just take um, them off and <laughs> they get, they get fixed, the right? Let them drain. And for the most part, you're good. Do your oil change and your lower unit change. Um, IOs have to be antifreeze flushed. Um, and if you don't do it, you'll be looking at replacing an engine. It's not a fun process. So. No, very expensive. And talk to anybody with a wakeboard boat. Yeah. <laughs> Has those um, issues. Fishing boat world, they don't do anything with IOs anymore. It's all outboards. And oh, really? Pontoons are pretty much all outboards now. Okay. There's- very few io pontoon companies out there anymore yeah okay and then um so outboard definitely probably the way to go based on that answer for a beginner and then one thing that i kind of ran into as uh, just my personal experience my first pontoon um i didn't know anything about owning a pontoon i i had just come off a year ownership on a um 2003 ranger comanche and uh Bought it used. It was 10 years old at the time. It was back in 2013. It was, you know, uh, first boat. Well, not really first boat. First boat that I like had to fun with and, you know, bought it for purpose of getting into bass fishing and learned boating on. And then quickly realized that, you know, 70 miles an hour is really, really cool, but not when your father-in-law wants to drink a Bloody Mary. So that's not going to work. So we got to get rid of the bass boat. <laughs> and, uh, well, I got a pontoon and when I got it, I didn't know. Um, I, I really, it was, you know, I, I will take full responsibility. I wasn't educated. I was coming in and I said, I, I want a pontoon. I had a general idea on size and capacity because of some of the events I, and people I wanted to have on the water with me. Um, but powering it, I was clueless. I had no idea. It, and I had a showroom model that was last up there. It was kind of a stock picked over a little bit when I got in. I loved the model, but in the showroom, they had a 40 on it. And it was a four-stroke 40. And I think that is historically what pontoons, pontoons were powered a little lower. And it was a putz boat. It was grandpa's, yeah, yeah, they always were, you know, just a lake tour, you know, almost no wake and don't spill my drink. And we're going to go take a little lake tour. Um, but I didn't really want that, but I didn't realize that's what I was getting when I bought a pontoon with a 40 on it. So can you just touch on a little bit of what you're getting horsepower, two stroke versus four stroke, and then where that sweet spot is for a beginner if they're going to look for an outboard. Yeah, definitely. So uh, generally your 20 foot and smallers are always going to be like a 60 or 90 horsepower. Um, Most of them are 90 horsepower max. Um, I mean, general rule obviously is max it out, but at the same point when you're talking new, when you start getting into big horsepowers, money starts adding up quickly. So right. Um, you know, your 22 foot pontoons, twin tubes, 115s are great engines for it. Um, you know, get you going, be able to do the tubing and, you know, some skiing and some fun sports stuff. Um, but yet also, you know, not crazy loud, not super obnoxious. So you can, you know, still use it for all the family fun too. Um, when you get into like fishing boat world, you're definitely going to want to watch out, you know, that those you want to kind of go max horsepower, um, that's going to be more of a resale aspect though on that world. Okay. Um, pontoons really, people don't worry about re- the, you know, max bar. You don't want to underpower it in your case with a 40 horse on a 22 foot boat. Right. You know, it's a hard to sell with that where if you had a 90 or 115, it would have been an, you know, an easy sell for you. Right. Right. Um, everything for the most part, is all four stroke nowadays. You're not really seeing, um, Actually, the real last two stroke kind of dropped out of the market when Evanrude left the world. Um, okay. So now you're sitting on Mercury doesn't even make a two stroke anymore. Um, they're actually really dead. nope. There's no more Optimax. It's all gone. Wow. Um, okay. The, the direct fuel injected two stroke. Um, so now they're actually dabbling in the propane world, um, getting hmm. propane powered motors for like campers and 
um, people that want to travel when you're off the grid because sure it's easier to travel and carry propane. Okay. Um, and then the next part would be um, getting into electric engines. You know, there that's coming to be a big thing. People yeah. are creating these 36 volt torpedoes. Um, I saw uh, those. That's those are interesting, man. <laughs> They are, but you, now you got to add, you know, so everyone's like, oh, the motor is so much lighter. Yeah, well, but now you got to add 200, 300 pounds right. of and batteries to yeah. make up for it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a separate, that's a like energy and uh, efficiency and logistics of fuel for your motor is probably a whole nother conversation. Because, yeah, you're trading off uh, gas for electric, but now the logistics of you being on the water and the reliability of you getting back is a very different conversation if you don't have gas on the boat anymore. Yeah. So well, but um, it's going to die out. You know, it's only so fast, so powerful. Um, right. Don't, don't have alternators. So you're not recharging your batteries. So yeah, you got to make sure you got battery juice. You know, it's the same as running yep. a gas engine to that point. Yep. Very true. Very true. But it's just one more extra step. <laughs> Right. You, you would have been doing it anyway with the gas and you know yep. uh, as long as you can turn it over you would have gotten back but uh, it's all new technology to see what happens but um so jumping back quick to the outboards to the beginners so let's say let's just use the the lawn 1775 as an example um is the the max on that 150 and then 115 does well or is the max 115 max would be it's actually 125 oh uh, okay no, do they make 125 anymore Mercury doesn't and Yamaha doesn't. Yeah, uh, I thought it was 115 to 150, yeah, right? Pretty much all make 115s or 150s now. There's a couple 135s in there. Okay. Um, yeah, most of the part, 115s would be max. Um, when you get into like the crossover, because they do a beefier transom and a little double side gun wells, um, they do allow the 150. That's about one of the only 17 footers with lawn that actually allows a 150. Out. Okay. I do remember reading, I was, it must've been the crossover, whichever one I was reading had a, it was a 1775 with 150. But um, what I want to kind of touch on is let's say you're, you really want that boat. So you want everything on that boat. Um, but like anybody looking at a boat, you're going to notice the change in price is significant with what motor you put on it. So the base package of the boat is going to be super attractive for a first time boat buyer. You're going to be like, Whoa, yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Sign me up. And then you're going to put a motor on it and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's more realistic. And uh, we need to have a little bit more discussion, but um, where is the sweet spot? Um, so you can kind of, you can go top to bottom or bottom to top on this of performance and cost. So let's say you like, obviously if you can swing it, you're going to max out the horsepower, but let's say you can't financially swing max horsepower, but you really want that 1775. Where's the sweet spot for performance and cost? Well, honestly, on that one, you almost want to go 175 because uh, with it, it depends on the manufacturer, but with a Mercury, the 7590 and 115 are 100% the same motor. Okay. Just different computer works and some jets and chips and some other stuff. Um, so, I mean, price-wise from a 75 to a 115, I mean, you're only talking, you know, 1500 bucks. It's not worth it okay. you get to do that. Um, especially when you're financing, I mean, at that rate, you're talking $8 a month on a monthly payment to, right. to on the one fifteen. Right. Um, so maybe the pontoon's a better example, actually, because then you're going to, you're, you're going to see a huge performance difference going from a 90 to even a one fifty. Um, right. and you might see a bigger significant cost difference because those pontoons are probably going to be rated for one fifty to even two fifty on some of the models. Um, so maybe you don't, you know, all the way up to 400 now. So yeah. So crazy on them. Yeah. So I guess it depends there, there, you might see a little bit more of a decent conversation with function versus cost and what you're really getting, you know, like if your top concern was speed, you know, what's your miles per hour difference between putting a 90 on it and a 150 and, and vice versa, you know, like a 115 or a yeah. 200 or, or something like that. You know, I guess pontoon. So a lot of the 22s, uh, especially in like the sport tri tune world, are going to be 150 horsepower. Um, so in like your case, like you said, you know, do you go with the 115, which is a common package, or do you max it out with the 150? Well, now you're talking a 3,000 to 3,500 swing in price. I mean, that's a big number. Right. Uh, you know, again, financing doesn't seem much because you're talking, you know, 24, 30 dollars a month more in a payment. But again, that can also be a breaker. You know, if you can't be over that 200 Correct. price or that 300 price, that makes a big deal to you. Yeah. Um, 
So I guess in the pontoon world, that's more where like the 115 on a 22 is a real common one because of that aspect alone. Um, also with the 115, um, you can stay with cable steering and still be comfortable on the boat. When you go up to the 150, you need to jump to hydraulic steering yeah. for steerings. Um, and that alone is a, a $1,500 package to do. So okay. um, that that's kind of where the big hurt jumps in that one. And um, yep. it's it can make or break the bank for sure on that. Okay. Now you kind of touched on uh, like a 90 to 115 being the sweet spot uh, earlier and, and not with regard to cost necessarily, but do you have like an absolute minimum is 90 the absolute minimum for any pontoon that you would recommend? Or is there a circumstance where you would go below a 90 on a pontoon? Um, a lot of 20 footers. So like the, the two 20 footers I had uh, in stock were both maxed out 90 horsepower is their rating. Both customers picked a 60 on it because they're on smaller lakes. You know, you start getting into these small 400 acre, 300 acre lakes um there's even some no wake lakes out there there's no reason to go to a bigger horsepower on it sure you literally just that couple that wants to go cruise around the lake and have a, a glass of wine or a beer with some hors d'oeuvres on a table you don't need the power you're just going cruising anyway so um yeah we th there are rules with it and um you know we can work on certain boats to tell you what it is but um I would say, you know, again, your, your 20 horsepower minimum would be 60 that I would recommend to put on it. Your 22s is probably that 90 to 115 range. Um, 24s are probably going to be at least 115, um, but most likely you're probably a 150 on it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when somebody comes in and they're not, let's, let's say they're not sold on the boat part and they're trying to negotiate the motor, let's say they're open, but they're more just overall cost. And so they're looking at the boat and the motor. Do you tend to steer people, um, on all thing, all other things being equal going to the next smaller size boat with a higher motor, or would you have, you know, depending on their function, you know, stay at that 22 foot pontoon and maybe do, you know, like you said, like that, maybe the 90 instead of the 115 or 150 versus like going down to a 20 with a 60, um, or the 90 on it, like to get closer to like, go to the 90 on the, on the 20 footer. Like if they're, I, if, I you know what I mean? Tell you to stay with the, the bigger boat and go with a little smaller engine. Okay. Uh, because when you're on the water, yeah, you can have more speed and everything, but you can't gain the room. So if you're a person who wants a lot of people on the boat at all times, big family, all the room, the room is going to be a lot more deal breaker than the horsepower is. Okay. You can always repower a boat later for a lot cheaper than it is to, you're not going to buy a new boat and put, you know, your same engine on it. Dealers don't like messing with that. So you're going to be buying a new whole package and you're just going to take a beating. So your best honestly is to buy the bigger boat with a smaller motor, maybe five, 10 years down the road, throw a bigger motor on it. Um, you know, a lot of these factories do repower programs and throw you incentives that way to do it too. So, okay. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I didn't end up repowering mine, but um, that is that still pretty common? Do you guys deal with that quite a bit? Yeah, I mean, and, and especially nowadays, what you're getting is you're getting a lot of the two-stroke people um, leaving the two-stroke world. They want four strokes. They want quiet engines, clean engines. Yeah. Get rid of having to fill an oil tank up or mix gas and oil. Yeah, uh, it's all going away. So that, that's yeah. huge right now is repowers with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess while we're right there, you know, talking beginner boats, can you just touch really quick on the difference between a four stroke engine and a two stroke engine and, and just on the basics, what that, that means for people? Somebody may not even know what two stroke means or four stroke means if they've never bought a boat before. Yeah. So two strokes going to be the old stuff that smokes and is loud. Um, you normally have an external oil reservoir that you have to fill. Um, it could be on the engine, it could be on the boat, or you may actually have to dump oil into your gas tank. Um, so it's going to be, you know, a loud, obnoxious motor. Um, but they tend, they tend to create a lot more power. And that's why two strokes were so popular for so long. Um, four stroke is just like your modern day car engine. You know, it's turnkey go. There's nothing to deal with. They're all, they're no, there's no carburation. Um, they're all electronic fuel injected. Um, so it's literally turnkey go just like your car engine. So you change the oil every so often and 
you're all done. So, I mean, four strokes are super quiet, like a car engine. Um, they've become a lot more powerful. They've created a lot more torque out of them. Um, honestly, a lot of the new four strokes probably are more powerful than a two stroke in their size and don't really? weigh much at all. Okay. I, that was my follow-up was what, if they've kind of made advancements on the total weight of them, cause then they used to be really heavy compared to the twos as well. They did. Uh, Mercury came out with aluminum blocks, which was huge because that cut off quite a bit of weight. Um, like when they had uh, their Verado 200 horsepower, it was a 680 pound motor, I believe it was. Yeah. And the new uh, 200 um, V6 engine, even the V8s are 505 pounds or 530 pounds. So you're wow. talking, you're cut off 180 pounds almost of weight. That's a, that's a big deal. You know, and that's only in a three to five year time period. They cut off 180 pounds. That's huge. Right. Yeah. That's a really big deal. Um, so we've got the motors covered. Can you talk a little bit about other rigging options that would be available? So you're coming in, you've got this boat you want to buy. Um, and, and maybe you can just pick two again. So we can just do the pontoon and, and the 1775. And, you know, somebody's like, I'm going to buy my first fishing boat. Um, I want that 1775, you know, I like, I got, I got kids. I want to take them tubing and stuff. So I think maybe I'll get that excess and get the ski pylon and it's going to be a lot of fun, but I kind of want to fish a couple tournaments maybe. So I'd like to have, you know, uh, maybe a fish finder and a trolling motor. Is that something you guys do? Maybe Definitely. some of the, what, what are some of the options you guys do? So we do that all in house, um, you know, fish finders, trolling motors, even rod holders, um, bait holders. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you can buy, um, but fishing boats are going to be the biggest one that add options because they don't load them with a lot of like cup holders. So you might want to add a cup holder into your, you know, Lund specific has our sport track system. So there's a lot you can do with that for mounting your options. Um, there's down riggers, um, you know, we're, we're seeing people add on. I mean, I, I just sold a 16 foot rebel, you know, being a little $20,000 bolt, but the guy put $12,000 in electronics onto it. Yeah. So all of a sudden this $20,000 boat turned into a $32,000 boat real quick. Yeah. Um, so it, it can add up. Um, but I mean, that's all something you got to think about too going into it. I mean, there's a lot of ways we can work around that, getting you different electronics to start out with or, you know, limiting what you do. Um, pontoon world and hurricane world, definitely. I mean, uh, biggest options are going to be like fenders for the boat. Um, okay big thing are going to be like turbo swings that are become huge at mounts to your motor it's for tubing um, and skiing oh uh, nice okay is it keeps the rope behind the prop rather than kind of hanging over the engine dangling okay um, now is that like a is it a steel frame that bolts to the deck itself is that how that's fixed or no nope, the turbo swing actually uses your motor mounts and attaches to those so it kind of mounts behind oh. behind the motor itself so it's actually okay hanging over the water and then it's got a, a roller wheel with a carabiner clip on it that you hook wow your that's and pretty come cool a long way with that kind of stuff yeah um, they do make like ski toe bars that mount to the deck themselves and go around the motor the problem okay, that's what i've seen that i think yeah, so those are meant more for skiing the problem is they tubes put a lot of torque on them um, they have a lot of uh, gravitational pull with the water so they put a lot of power on it and you can actually break the bar or your boat by tubing on those oh wow okay um, a lot of them will tell you right on them you know not meant for water sports or inflatable sports meant only for skiing and kneeboarding and wakeboarding okay good to know uh, yeah that's the hot tip because <laughs> i've seen i couldn't tell you how many times i've seen tubers behind something like that and i yeah, you know i couldn't tell you, i didn't know that yeah i try to for i try to tell everyone when i go through the deal but that's definitely something you got to look at yeah and, uh, covers are huge. You know, you got to remember, are you storing the boat inside, outside? Is it on a lift or where's it going? Um, covers make or break. It can make or break a lot of deals. Uh, good news is all pontoons come standard and that I sell with a cover. So it's not even a question. It has it with it. That's great. Um, and I'm not, I'm never going to order a stock fishing boat um, without a cover just to have in the showroom because I know it's obviously probably the number one option every, right. anyone else for Okay. And are they standard just button snap covers? Are they, are they bungee clips? Uh, how, how many options do you have to cover the boat technically that you guys offer? 
So the factory covers nowadays, none of them are really snap anymore. They're all going to like a clip system. Okay. Uh, if you want to go with like total custom fit, we got a bunch of suppliers we can work with, um, but they can custom make covers to fit your boat 100% perfect. Um, whether you want, say, like a bow rider or a hurricane, you may want to cover to just cover the front separate because you yep. want to go all cruising and you're not going to use that space. You don't want it to get wet or, you know, leaves in it or whatever. Um, okay. So you can do a lot of different options with that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, anything crazy in the pontoon world? I've definitely heard and seen of some pretty uh, elaborate cover systems and convertible systems that you guys yeah. offer anything like that. Uh, you know, electric bimini tops are becoming hugely powerful. Um, a lot of people are putting them on. Uh, it's yeah. like a $2,000 option, $2,500 option. But, you know, when you're coming into your boat lift at night or coming off the water late at night, you know, had a couple cocktails and you're trying to put down a bimini top. It's not the easiest thing in the world with one or two people. Even without the cocktails, it is, it's, a, it's an effort for sure, so getting that thing on there. It goes down way easier don't need to worry about it yeah yeah that's awesome um do you guys run uh or have the option for sea legs or any sort of hydraulic legs on pontoons have you heard of those yeah so we used to be a sea leg dealer um there, but there's many companies that make them out there right uh, um, but yeah i mean we can get some through some suppliers that can be installed on there um they make them for twin tube and tri-tune packages Okay. Can you touch on a little bit what they are just for listeners out there? Cause like I, you know, I've seen them a couple of times and I'm sure people, have not, they probably don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah. So sea legs are, um, I guess that would just be a manufacturer of them the sea legs. Uh, but basically what they are is they're, they're hydraulic legs that actually attach under the boat. So they act as your lift, um, like your storage lift. So you can go to a sandbar and just hit a button and hydraulically raise the boat out of the water and act as your anchor or your lift to keep the boat afloat. And then you can, you know, hang out and come back and you just hit a button, crank it up and go. But some people literally use them as their lifts and at, at a marina too, they'll pull right in, hit a button and raise the boat up out of the water with it. You right. don't have to buy, you know, a $10,000 lift, then you buy the the sea legs and use it for it. So. And winter storage too, right? You can drop them right on the, on the ground and Correct, yeah. raise it off the ground. Yep. It's hydraulic. So yeah, you could store them and, you know, on flat land with it too. Interesting. Is there, do you, I mean, I don't know anything about them other than the fact that they exist. Are, do you have any idea on like the total length, like what they would, you know, is there a certain, is it six foot, 12 foot that you would have to be in to use them correctly or. Uh, so it totally depends. You can buy them in different packages and lengths. Like oh, okay. Said. So there are some that just go down and, you know, basically only get you a, a foot off the ground, the pontoon. So yeah, if you're in eight feet, six feet of water, they're not really going to work for you. Um, sure. There are companies that make extension ones that can go down and actually raise straight up so they can get you. I, I want to say it's probably about six to eight feet is max depth. You can really use them in though. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, we won't stick around there too long because most people just probably haven't even heard of it. But it's just a curious, it, like I always thought it was like such a cool idea to like just be able to hit a button and do that. Um, it does, but you got to remember it also adds a lot of weight to the boat because they're sure. attached to the bottom. And it's also another thing for the water spray to hit. So it actually hurts your performance if they're not mounted right because the water hits it and actually slows you down. Sure. Sure. And probably one more thing to go wrong uh, with storage. And, and especially if you're in, you know, Wisconsin, like we are, but anywhere where you're going to get a freeze, you got to worry about probably all that winterization stuff and up and down to the cold and ice and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, And if you get water in your hydraulic lines for any reason, and it freezes, you're going to have a lot bigger issues. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so probably the big, like you said, uh, we, we went through a lot of gear, a lot of boat options. Um, probably one of the biggest conversations that everybody has with you is any buyer, but especially beginners is, is money, right? So we're going to talk like, how do you buy a boat, uh, from the money side of things? So we've, let's say we've picked out a boat. It doesn't matter what it is. You pick whatever one you want and just kind of like talk through the real basic process of how it works for you guys and, and feel free to speak in generalities for the industry, uh, for somebody who's kind of walking through the door and never, never done it. Yep. So, I mean, biggest thing is obviously, I mean, whether it's a finance deal or a cash deal, um, it doesn't make a difference to a dealer is whether it's cash or finance, because we're all floor planning these boats anyway. So 
you know, cash isn't really king anymore like it used to be. Okay. It's not like we can just pocket it. And, um, you know, we got to pay off the bullets to the factory. So <laughs> um, that, that's a big question. Everyone always thinks cash saves you money, but it doesn't save you anything, actually. Okay. Good um, to know. The biggest part with finding out your price is I think with a lot of people is looking at what monthly payments are to finance the boat. Okay. Um, you got, I mean, the Marine world, you can finance a boat for as long as 15 years. I mean, you're talking house term loans on this. Yeah. Um, you know, we can get your payments down pretty low. I mean, a lot of these boats you're seeing, you know, low to mid $200 a month ranges to get an impact out the door. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. And that's rigged and taxes and everything. That's, yeah, yeah that's well, impressive. 10% down is a lot of what they require. It's not like a house where you, you got to do crazy numbers. It's 10% down. So $40,000 boat, all you have to come up with is $4,000 and you got yourself a boat and a $280 a month payment. Right, right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something to think about when you have... Um, a down payment to consider. So you said 10%. Is that pretty standard uh, across whatever loan uh, reach, yeah, or much, loan person you go to? All loan companies are 10% for the most part in the marine world. Okay. Okay. Um, now you guys, uh, I think you mentioned, but if not, do you guys offer in-house lending? So if somebody comes in, they don't have anybody they want to lend with, will you guys finance? Yeah, we got a couple companies to work with. So, okay. you know, I got my normal bank I use being North Shore, but uh, they're, they're going to be your better term for your, your better credit scores and, um, you know, not crazy debt to income ratios. Um, they're going to be the best one to get you with, but I do have other people that will pretty much take for the most part, anyone, um, they'll shop banks and find someone who can help you out and get you in it. Um, but I, I can tell you, if you have a low credit score, don't be shocked to see a, a nine to 15% interest rate. They're going to do sure. it to protect themselves. Uh, but they'll get you into a boat. I mean, okay. So it's not a hard no. You just got to be uh, realistic with what's going to come back on the sheet. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but a lot of the dealers are smart enough. We try to ask you those questions up front. Um, you'd be shocked how many people will lie to you about it. But you, I mean, my number one question is, have you ever filed bankruptcy in the last 10 years? And a lot of times people will tell you no. And you'll go back there and you'll send it in, come back, and I'll say bankruptcy in the last 10 years. And you go ask them, they're like, oh, but it wasn't chapter 13. Well, it doesn't matter. It's bankruptcy. So they yeah. don't like that when you're buying recreational world. If you're buying a car or a house, it's a different story. But when you're buying rec, when it's not a necessity, they don't, right. they don't like seeing that. Yeah, that's a really good point um, for everybody listening is recreation versus necessity. And, you know, you may not you may not process that when you're thinking about boat, you may just be thinking about the fun and, and thinking about getting a loan. And it's a, it's a thing you have to purchase most likely with a loan. Most people aren't going to walk in and buy the first boat with cash, but um, it's not, I don't, I, it doesn't seem like an intuitive thought to think like recreation versus necessity, even though that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's an excellent point. Um, I guess uh, you can, so you can come in with your own loan or lender, I should say, as well. And how, I guess, how does that, so if somebody has a bank they want to work with, do you guys make phone calls or how does that work um, from that person? Yeah, so us specifically, what I like to do is, um, you know, we try to get the customer to put something down just to hold the boat to get the paper going. So in the world, obviously nowadays, nothing's sold without money down. So, you know, whether if it's, an, it's a $100 bill or a $500 credit card run, something just to hold it. Um, and then we'll write up the contract, do everything for you. Um, and a lot of times I just like to tell them, have your banker call me, you know, talk to your bank. Here's my card, have them email or give me a call. I'll get them the information they need. Um, take the stress off the customer because they feel when you do that, they feel stressed um, when you're not helping them because they don't know what questions the banks are going to ask and they don't know right. what to give them. Right. Um, but yeah, we do that a lot, you know, more than welcome to help you out and get your okay your finance needs and get them done. So, um, you know, selling a boat to us is obviously what we do. So if we can help anyone get in it, that's what we're going to do. Absolutely. So yeah, if you're coming in to buy a boat and whether you have your own lender or not, you don't need to bring anything with you. You just, if you, if you know who you want to use, it sounds like you guys can make those connections. No problem. It's yeah. not like they got to bring homework with them or nothing like that. Insurance is another thing to think about. A lot of people forget about that. Um, yep. 
with financing, all banks are going to require you to maintain insurance on the boat at the time. Um, biggest question we always get, how expensive is boat insurance? Boat insurance is cheap. Yeah. Um, an average boat, even with crazy electronics on it, I mean, you're probably talking – on a, that 1775 impact with 10 six grand, 800 bucks a year or something and maybe max i mean you're probably really talking three to four hundred a year really yeah insurance is just cheap and you know i, I think they're you're not you don't see many issues with it right right probably. yeah that's a that's a great point i'm actually i'm talking to somebody on the next that what will be the next episode uh when this airs uh the following episode will be on Boat insurance. It'll, I'm going to talk to somebody uh, from American Family, and we're going to chat about recreational insurance. So, because um, you're right, it's a total just no, like almost nobody thinks about it, and it's so accessible and so cheap that I mean, it, there's no excuse not to go down the road and have it when insured. Wrap it right in with your house insurances, and right? Your insurances go through your same planner. They all do it nowadays. Yep that popular so it's exactly right it's exactly get, right uh, package discounts for you know ensuring them all together right um anything that comes to mind uh as far as uh your experiences over the years of like you know either hard lessons or funny story just something that you know would kind of educate a first-time buyer and say like you know what maybe i don't want to do that or, or maybe i really want to do that you know, have you, have you been a part of any of those stories over the years? Oh, there's always some good stories with people. Um, you know, I, I always love the ones where you can tell them to measure their garage 12 times to make sure they get it to fit. And they buy the boat the first time they take it home and they back it in the garage and they call you and they go, I just took out the light or I just took out the fender. Or, you know, they, they, they thought they had more room than they had. Uh, or the boathouses are always big ones, you know, buy a pontoon and take it. Well, I got a 30 foot boathouse. Well, a 24 foot pontoon with a motor trimmed up at an angle with room for the winch and stuff. You're not fitting in a 30 foot boathouse. So yeah, you know, it, there's some good ones with those. Oh man. Yeah. That's just, <sighs> or the people that call you all the time and say they've never put, they've never backed a boat into a slip. I mean, if you want to see something funny, go sit at a boat ramp for a couple hours and just yeah. watch people try to back a boat up. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Right. And if you are a first time boat buyer or have never done that, go do that. And not just to laugh, but to, t- you know, try and figure some of that out um, and go as far as to try and go with somebody who has a boat and ask if you can, you know, get a few tips or practice or, you know, if you get access, like work with it and see if it's something that you're going to be comfortable doing. Cause it makes boat ownership a lot easier if you can transport your boat safely. Back it in the water safely. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be real hard to use from land. So, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That's, um, that's a, that's a big thing in general. So not just trailering or backing up, but I think one of the biggest things as a first time boat buyer that's so intimidating is unlike the car world, it's so rare to find people that will do, um, I guess in the industry be like demo rides. So access to models that dealers are selling that would take you out on the water and give you a tour of the vehicle you're trying to purchase. And that's very common in the auto industry. It's an expectation actually, but quite the opposite in the boating world. I, I would say it's not common and not the expectation that you no, would unless get you're on the water and have a rental fleet. You can't legally do that because you can't gas up the engines or they're considered used engines and run them. Hmm. Um, so that does get very hard. Um, you know, like we do a demo pontoon every year and a, a demo fishing boat, um, but that's just one model. So and that's a yeah. big question. Customers ask like, can I try it before I buy it? It's like, no, yeah. unfortunately, at the auto world but it can't just take you down to the water and take it because now it's no longer a new boat right you know? yeah that it's and that's so unfortunate because you could really answer a lot of questions in a short period of time uh for especially beginners you know maybe you'd still answer some questions for people that have done it a few times but i man, think it'd those- be cool if like factories did like a traveling fleet yeah. where they went to like it doesn't have to be every dealer's territory but like say in us Milwaukee, find a lake in between where you can right. put it up and we, you know, both dealers bring their salesmen there and their people and we can take people out. You're not there to sell a boat at that point. You're there just to teach them about the boat or 
there, right. show the different ones, and then they go to whoever their local dealer is to talk about the boat. Um, right. And the beauty of that is it doesn't seem like a sale at the time, but if you're the first company, whether you're the boat company or the motor company or, or the electronics company to give somebody their first positive experience. And then they like, well, I learned on this, you know what you probably just did. You probably just sold a brand and they're probably going to go with that brand on their first purchase. And like, you don't need to sell them in it at the time. If you just are the one to get them comfortable in it, like they're probably going to lean on that when they make the first purchase. Exactly. Cause that's what they remember, you know, right. Oh, this, this factory had a test for me to go on. So that's that's to grow human that nature to do that. I mean, you, that, it's not just the boating industry is, you know, you do that for pretty much anything that you're selling. You but, don't buy a car without test driving it. Exactly. And if it's the only car you drove, well, you know, you kind of deal with the devil, you know, it's like, well, I drove that. I loved it. I don't know about this other one and there's no test drive. So I guess like I'm going to lean towards the one I know, yep. but yeah, that, it's, a, it's a very curious thing. I, I was up in um, Door County, Sturgeon Bay, when the Elite Series was there, the Bassmaster Elite Series. Uh, this was probably 2014-ish, somewhere in there, plus or minus a year or two. And um, they had demos there with Nitro and Mercury and Yamaha and Skeeter and, you know, all these big expo-type events um, before you know, on shore, but they also had boats there to demo. And they had, I think that what they were, I think the way they were doing it, if I remember correctly, is they had guides, like sponsored guides with the brands yeah. out running their guide boats that were either that year's model or the year before with not a whole lot of tweaks different. And they were taking them out and giving them performance tests on uh, Green Bay or on Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. Um, there's a few out there that do it. I mean, down south, they do it all the time. When you're talking like the big Miami and Fort Lauderdale boat shows, that's a whole mm -hmm. different ball game. When the okay. the big engine factories wanting to show off their new product, I mean, they'll throw it on multiple boats just so you can see how it goes and take you on rides. But the inland with us, that's not huge at all. I mean, you don't yeah. see anyone really doing demo lake testing. Um, again, unless they have a rental fleet where they have multiple brands on a rental, because then they can take you out on the rental side of it. Right. Right. Yeah. That's man. That's unfortunate because it really is one of those industries where you have like this perfect storm of people with not a lot of experience and there's no really way to get it unless you're on a boat doing it. So it's, it's just a weird kind of catch 22. <laughs> it's like, you have to buy it and force yourself to learn it before you learn it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a hard one. That's for sure. But yeah, that's, you know, and that's why you guys, I, I guess that's perfect for the next little uh, bullet point here is maybe just chat about some of the upcoming events and things you do that would, you know, if you're on the fence or you, you think you might be in the market for a new boat, but you're not quite there, ready to pull the trigger. Do you guys offer any sort of information or, you know, I know you guys do um, your open houses uh, and with COVID, obviously things might be a little different, but um, what, what's out there for people who are kind of like in that, like, you know, getting a little warmer, almost ready to buy, you know, where can they go to find some more information? What are you guys doing? Um, so obviously you can, you know, we try to put a, a blast of information on our Facebook page, um, manufacturers pages or Facebook pages are huge. Okay. Um, they have videos, they give you a lot of that, you know, pictures and display of their product on there. Um, you know, but the, I mean, the biggest is, is if you're kind of like that verge line, you're not sure if you're ready to buy or not. Um, I think you really need to either find a, a friend who has something close to at least what you're looking at. doesn't mean to be specific exact model, but at least close. Um, see if they'll let you go out with them. Um, or you need to try to find, you know, you got to make up your mind whether you just want to buy. Cause unfortunately, like you said, we can't, we don't demo them. It's not the same world. So it's, it gets a little, you, you kind of almost are like jumping off a cliff blindfold and not knowing what's on the other end of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So talking to people, you know, that's probably yeah, the easiest thing to do good. is reach out, right? Like yeah, go to the out. manufacturers, the dealer, just reach out and start there, you know, and they'll yeah, point you in the right direction. Is use stuff. Some use people use market, they'll let you test drive. Sure. Know, because they you know you want to prove it works yep uh, which that's a different world because you yeah. just that is you want to make sure it runs a lot of times correct ask you to take it down the water um so that's kind of another one where you could maybe find someone who has one to use i mean not to say you want to use them just to get an advantage in it 
um, but at least so you know what it's like. Or right. even, even buy a used boat, your very first boat, get used to the boating aspect of it and then buy your dream used, your dream new boat so you know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. I mean, as we kind of didn't touch on that earlier, but really quick, you have some highlights, lowlights on, you know, new boat versus used boat for a first time buyer. I mean, you definitely just highlighted a pro um, getting out, learning your way through a used boat that's going to function for you, maybe not perfectly, but you're not going to take that huge market hit buying a new boat and realize, oh, this isn't for me, or I can't hack it in this type of boat. You know, maybe that is a great option for you if you don't have access to learning otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great point. I mean, I, it's something I would highly recommend to people. And um, obviously first is, so you don't waste the money on it for, to buy it for a year and sell it is try to see if you have a friend or a relative, right. or, you know, someone you can get out on one. Um, if you can't, then, you know, definitely buy something new used, try it for a year or two see, make sure you like that. You know, I mean, some people buy fishing boats and realize, oh, I should have bought a pontoon boat because I'm not going to fish as much, but you can still fish off a pontoon boat. It doesn't matter if it's a fishing one or not, you can still fish off of it. Absolutely. Fishing boat has kind of gone the other way. I mean, you're starting to be able to do more other stuff with it, but if you have a lot of young kids and stuff, pontoons are still great with the tall side. So you get yourself in a fishing boat you're always worried in the back of your mind, your kid's going to jump off the side of the boat or fall overboard. So it can go either way. Totally. Um, Somebody who has, so total beginner again, used versus new. um, What are some of the things that if somebody was like dead set on buying a used boat uh, for whatever their reason, what are some real quick tips for buying used? And, you know, I know you guys sell used boats there but maybe touch on like, you know, what are the benefits of buying through used through a dealer versus like, you know, Craigslist or Facebook marketplace or, or something like that. I think the biggest with a dealer buying is generally we've probably inspected the boat and done compression checks and all that. So you can kind of, most dealers hopefully can, will be honest with you on how the condition of the boat. Um, like us, I know we run a 52 point check. So I'm going to, first thing we'd ever do is pull compression bad compression. I won't even look at it for trade. Um, but you know, it, it just gives it, it should give you a peace of mind that the boat's been looked at. Now, if you are buying private party, um, you can tell the buyer, Hey, I'm interested. I'll put money down, but I want a buyer's inspection on it. Um, are you willing to pay for that? They, they may say, no, they may say love split it, or they may say, yeah, I'll pay for it. Depends what the, the price is. Um, but that's a huge thing is to be able to take it to then an authorized dealer, um, someone who can look at it and tell you if there is anything wrong with it or not. Okay. And is that something that the buyer would have to call and set up ahead of time? Like, would you recommend that, you know, like, let's say I'm looking to buy a used boat off of Facebook marketplace and I really want you guys to check it out or another dealer. Like, do I call you guys up first and say, Hey, I'm going to go look at this boat. Um, I'd like you guys to do a check. Is that something you do? And then go from there. Correct. Yeah. You know, first I would say is obviously chalk with the person to see if they're willing to do it. Um, if they're willing to do something, um, definitely call a dealer, get on their schedule. Cause you know, especially come summer, we're booking one, two, three weeks out at a time sometimes. Um, especially on that. Cause it's a longer job. It's not like it's just a quick hour inspection normally. Right. Um, so you want to make sure you get on the schedule. You, you can always cancel and say, you know, Hey, I didn't buy the boat. It didn't work out. Mm-hmm. A dealer would rather have you cancel on them doing that. than call them and be like, Hey, I'm going to look at a boat right now. Can you look out for me tomorrow? It's not, yeah. it's not going to work that way. Okay. Um, how does it work? Uh, as far as actually following through and doing the inspection, is that something that the current owner who's selling the boat would trailer to you guys? Would somebody go out there or is it, is there any responsibility on the potential purchaser um so i would say that's a negotiation between the purchaser and the seller okay Um, they need to get the boat to us as a dealer um but they also you know that needs to be negotiated first who's taking the boat there and who's paying for it got it Um, you don't want to just get the boat there and then get the inspection done and be like oh it runs like crap well at that point if the buyer hasn't or the seller hasn't said they're going to pay for it they're going to make you pay for it Right. Uh, but if you can negotiate it up front or figure something out and say they're going to pay for it, 
generally what we do on that aspect is we get, we want those paid up front. Um, so if it's going to be the seller paying for it, we tell you to have the seller call us, make the appointment with it, um, give us a credit card, get it paid for. So that way, whether it's you bringing the boat here or them, it's all paid for. Um, so we don't have that issue. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, and any private market. So you don't know, you don't want to get stuck in the middle of someone's argument. No. Cause then you don't get paid because neither one wants to pay for it. If there's something going wrong. Right. Um, any, like from your perspective, any sort of, uh, liability, um, things to look out for as far as, uh, buying a boat off the used market. Um, you know, I guess uh, specifically I was thinking about that transaction. So I, I would be cautious myself as a first time boat buyer in general, but now, especially knowing what I know, I would never volunteer to tow somebody else's boat to you to get it checked. Um, yeah, I would, I would always say it's best to try to get the seller to take it there just because yeah. if, if the tire blows on the way there and you haven't bought the boat yet, right. you know, who's responsible? Did you hit something or was it just a faulty tire? There, there is a lot of liability that goes into that. And that's why we don't get involved in the hauling of it and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense um, too. It just, take, we got to take it off ours. And even with the inspection, you know, we can say at the point it's we did the inspection, it's all fine. And then we'll say that in writing. But as soon as the boat leaves again, we don't know what happened. So if a tire right. blows on the way or you take it to the lake the first time and it overheats, you know, we can't guarantee it didn't get stuffed with sand or something else. So it totally it means, yes, the inspection gives you kind of peace of mind, but also at the same time, you know, sometimes there's issues we can't find too, you know. Sure. Yeah, it's a different running amount of holes than it is running in the water. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I guess advantages for buying used through you guys, you get that peace of mind, you're doing the checks, and you obviously took the engine in uh to be able to resell it. So it passed your inspection as worthy of even reselling before you even get somebody in the door yeah, who wants to buy it. Money into something that's not, you know, worthy. Right. Uh, other advantage, I guess, as a buyer on used product coming from a dealer is um, generally dealers are willing to wait test used product because it's already used. So now I don't have to take a brand new boat and throw it on the water. Okay. Uh, so it's already used. So, you know, there are advantages like that. If I need a light test one, you know, if we want to make sure you're pretty serious about it. I'm not just going to take every person out. Um, but you, if you're serious, we'll get you out of the water on it so you can run it. Okay. That makes sense. And that's a really great uh, tip again, back to somebody who's never done it. If that, you know, if you're coming from, I'm not sure about it, maybe that is a, another check in the pro column going, going used, but maybe going through the dealer to get the used boat. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, right now we kind of, you, you don't want to really belabor the COVID point, but you know, you're talking about parts and manufacturing and how messed up the system is and how hard it is to get stuff. But, you know, have you noticed that the used market is also quite a bit higher than normal? At least I have on like, maybe not in the dealer realm, but like Facebook marketplace and Craigslist, like people are just price gouging is the wrong term. Cause it's not that high, but man, it's, you're going to pay for things that you wouldn't normally pay for in the used market right now. Right now. Yeah. And that's the thing with the used market. It fluctuates so much, but um, right now it's extremely high. Yeah. I mean, there's some used boats out there. I see. I've honestly, I'd take an eye on it. And sometimes there'll be a year or two old boat where they're asking what they paid for it, you know, yep. and it's only a grand less than a brand new one. Right. Um, you go back and you look and someone bought it cause it was a grand less than the new one and they wanted it. But now you start running into warranty issues and a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah. Is that, so do you, uh, you know, if you're not familiar, that's fine, but like for finance, so like, let's say you bought a boat in this era on the used market and you ran into that situation, it's a year old and you're paying almost the same price. Can you potentially run into financing issues with lenders and, and boat value differentials? Um, generally, no. I mean, they, they understand the market too. I mean, there, okay. there's blue books out there just like there are for cars and they all run off of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess to a point, I mean, they're, they're never going to give you, you know, if you're, if you're asking 50 grand for a boat that's blue book valued at 20 grand to find, they're not going to do it. They're going to finance probably max of 20 grand. Right. And then it's um, going to be on you for whatever you're trying to correct, yeah. buy it for over that. Correct. Yeah. 
So, and it all depends on the bank. Some banks are more lenient and some are more strict on it too. So, okay. Um, so let's say we've got the deal done, figured out the boat, got the financing, everything's been signed. What happens then? So this time of the year, obviously, most of the time we hold the boat for you. Okay. Uh, and then we say, give us a call, you know, a week or two in advance. And when you want it, come April, May, June, whatever month it is. And we set it up to, you know, depending on the customer, if new time, a lot of times we take them out on the water for, you know, an hour run or whatever, take them to the ramp close by, get them in the water on the boat, teach them how to use the boat. Um, and then either let it, let them be with it and they take it, hook up to the trailer um, and use it or you haul it back to the shop and then they take it from there. Okay. Excellent. And then, um, so yeah, so you said you hold on to it now until you get open water, but, um, assuming that, uh, like somebody comes in next week and they buy it and you don't have it in stock or, or let's say you're ordering a boat, what happens in that scenario where you've picked out your boat and, you know, you're ready to buy it, you buy it, but it, like, you know, up front, it's not going to be available for like a standard amount of time. Yeah. So, I mean, I, in, the, in that scenario, normally you just get the down payment. Okay. Uh, because a lot of banks won't finance without serial numbers and stuff. Um, so normally the banks will try to lock in for a certain time period on a rate. Um, so that's one thing you always got to look into. So in this day and age, when we were ordering boats in December and they weren't going to be here till June, um, you can't tell a customer the rate's guaranteed. You can get them approved, but you can't tell them the rate's guaranteed because sure. they're only going to lock it for 90 days. You know, they're not going to lock a rate for six months because they don't know what's going to happen in the market. Sure. Um, so it can really depend on what, what the time length is looking like to get it. In a general year, though, yeah, you would get the 10% down or whatever the down payment is the customer is putting down. Get the order going when it comes in. That's when you do the final paperwork. So you say within 10 days of board arriving, it has to be paid off. You do the final paperwork, get it done. Okay. Um, you know, in that meantime, when it's coming in, if there's like electronics for a fish finder or a trolling motor we need to order, um, we'll get that stuff ordered. So we have it there when the boat shows up, we can install it. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. That's awesome. So then it, you like, it, it's like maybe not ideal if you didn't want to wait that long, but it gives you this extra time to get these other things taken care of. Yeah. Okay. You know, that, and that can be hard to get certain stuff. So not all electronics are going to be available right away. Sometimes we got to, you know, like especially right now, it's a struggle to get stuff. So, um, you know, I try to make a list of what we have in stock at all times for me and my salesman. So I can give it to him and be like, this is what we have. Try to sell this. If you're going to sell this other product, you have to tell the customer there's no guarantee when we're going to get it. Right. Um, you know, I just ordered a boat for one of my pro staffs, right? Literally the last day you could order a boat. Um, and it was, he was told July before he'll even see his boat as a pro staff. Wow. Um, good news is he has one now, obviously. So he can, he'll be yeah. able to use that. And he has a buyer that's willing to let him keep it. Um, but it, it, that's a hard situation to get into when you're trying to tell someone they have to wait six months to get a boat. Right. Yeah. Especially if they're ready to buy, like, it's not like they're him and hawing or anything. It's like, I, you know, I want it now. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, maybe touch on that. Just I, that's gotta be so common, but is that pretty typical where you get, once you do get somebody who's like full commit, like, you know, they're not on the fence anymore, but you probably can't get the boat to them fast enough. Is that correct? Yeah, especially during like when it is like April and May for fishing yeah. season and stuff. Yeah, I mean, you could you could have everything in stock and, you know, it could be a Wednesday and you'll tell them you can rig it on Friday somehow. Uh, they're, they're still going to say it's not fast enough. They want it Thursday or that night right. or whatever. Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah. I want it yesterday. Right, right. Oh, man. Um, so I guess the biggest question I have left is if you buy a boat, does it, does it come with the floating keychain? Yeah, big one. Yes, <laughs> you buy a boat for me. You get a floating keychain. All sold. right, I'm sold. Let's do it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's man. Well, Andy, this has been fantastic, and we've uh, kind of gone way past the hour here, but it's so fun talking boats. I I love it. I miss being on the water, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, answer some questions, and hopefully, uh, this helps a lot of people i i know i've been in the beginner boat scene buying you know two 
different kinds of boats now for the first time. And, and both were beginner processes and you just learn so much going through it, but there's so much I wish I knew when I did it. And I, I hope this really helps people um, for that first time purchase. So Andy, any closing thoughts you want to throw in there or, you know, upcoming events you want to plug? Uh, upcoming events. I don't have any, unfortunately with COVID going on, we're just not going to be the dealer to put people through that. Uh, but I do want to say, if you have questions, needs, you're looking at new use, doesn't matter if you're working with us as a dealer, um, you know, reach out, ask questions, get a, get second opinions from other dealers, because some dealers, you know, are just going to try to get the sale done and go. Um, so definitely reach out to us. We're more than welcome to help you and get some answers for you. Perfect. Where, where can they find you at? Uh, so you can reach us online. You can go right to our website at feralmarine.com. That's P-H-A-R-O marine.com. Uh, hit the contact us button on the little button. Uh, we get text messages. So you can text us direct to our main phone number, or you can always just email us at sales at feralmarine.com and we'll get, we'll get you answers. Perfect. All right, man. Thanks so much. This has been incredible. And I can't wait for some open water here and talk boats more. Good talking with you, Dustin. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Andy.